good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, including the director of our institute, Professor Subrantha Mitra. It's a pleasure to welcome you to today's talk by Kunda Dixit, and thanks for turning up on a somewhat wet uh, morning. Uh, just goes to show how big a draw Kunda is, as well as possibly the paucity of talks on Nepal. <laughs> Uh, today's talk is intriguingly titled Nepal Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Uh, Kunra Dixit, as many of you are aware, is the editor and publisher of Nepali Times in Kathmandu. He started his career with the BBC uh, at the United Nations in New York and served as a regional editor, Asia Pacific for Interpress Service. Uh, Mr. Dixit is a graduate of Columbia University. He's also visiting faculty of media studies at Kathmandu University. His books include Dateline Earth, Journalism as if the Planet Mattered, and the People's War Trilogy, which is on the Nepal conflict. Over to you, Kunda. Maybe uh, 45 minutes or so, would that sure. be? And then we'll have time for enough time for Q&A. Uh, thank you, and thanks for turning out in such a large number, despite the rain in the morning. Um, it's really great to be here and back in Southeast Asia, where I used to be based for uh, about eight years um, in the old days before I went back uh, home to Nepal. Um, maybe part of the reason uh, is the turnout is high is because of the title, <laughs> Rock in the Hard Place. And um, since I think some of you may know more about Nepal than others, I would have a more general slideshow, and then we can go into more specific uh, questions that you uh, may have. Uh, I will basically be starting out with um, a brief history for Nepal for those who are not familiar, uh, go into more of uh, the recent disasters that we have suffered, both natural and political, and then um, to actually what's happening in, um, uh, these uh, next few months with the elections coming up. Uh, and then we can go into discussions and maybe answer your questions. Uh, Nepal is, um, the reason for the title actually is because uh, geotectonically geotecto and geopolitically we are situated and squeezed between uh, two of the world's largest countries. And this slide actually from the space shuttle shows you the white bits in the middle is where Nepal is. On the left is the darker area of the, uh, the Indo-Gangetic Plains. And the reason it's dark is because it's uh, vegetation, uh, because the mountains actually block the rains, and most of the rain falls to the south. And on the right is the Tibetan Plateau, and the reason it's brown and yellow is because it's an arid, <coughs> high-altitude high desert where um, the monsoons don't get to. And as you know, may know from the past few weeks, the flood disaster, and it's all related to the topography uh, which is that the Bay of Bengal monsoon is uh, is trapped by the um, by the um, uh, the mountains, and if you zoom in to ground level, this is what it looks like. Um, you are right at the boundary between the, the Tibetan Plateau and the mid hills of Nepal, and what this uh, river, the Kali Gandaki, shows you and proves is that the rivers are older than the mountains. So something about the Hindu mythology of worshipping the rivers actually goes back to this geological fact that uh, the main rivers of Nepal, uh, the uh, Kosi, the um, Gandaki, and the, and the Karnali, they start in China and Tibet. And they cut through the mountains. And so they, they were cutting through the mountains as the mountains rose. Uh, and this also shows you from ground level the, the rain shadow so you have the, the vegetation below the mountain there on the, on the background, and you see the desert-like conditions in the foreground. Um, so looking at the map, for those uh, who may not be familiar, you can see that we are right there in between with Bhutan and Nepal. And contrary to most um, uh, perceptions, Bhutan and Nepal don't even have a contiguous border. So we, we border India and China, but we don't have a bo we don't border each other. Um, there's um, what the state of Sikkim in between, and uh, the area which had the recent dispute is right there. You can see it on the map, uh, right where the the, the China, Bhutan, and um, and India borders meet, and you can also see from this map exactly why it's so 
strategically important for both countries. Uh, the Chicken Neck and the Silgari Corridor with Bangladesh right there, uh, separating Nepal uh, and Bhutan with only 25 kilometers of India in between. And that little corridor connects the, the entire northeast of India with the rest of the mainland. Uh, Nepal's history, for those of you who just want a very brief recap, uh, it's the oldest nation state in South Asia, existed before India as a state existed and when uh, British were in India. And at that time, in, it was actually British South Asia. Um, and um, after the initial conquest of the, the Shah Kings, um, the, um, Nepal stretched all the way to what is now uh, Punjab uh, on the west and Sikkim in the east and that is what and you can see the the gradual after the 1816 uh, treaty uh, the gradual dismemberment of Nepal if you will uh, the, the brown parts uh, returned to Nepal uh, after 18 after uh, 1840 after 1850 and the the slightly uh, yellowish parts on the left on the western Nepal were uh, taken away by the British after the 1816 Sugauli Treaty and also the, the Sikkim area on the right. So what is Nepal today is the yellow bit in the middle only. Um, and you have uh, the, the whole Rana period from 1847 onwards with Changabadur's coup. Um, very brief timeline of the whole Rana period uh, from 1847 to 1951 is here, you can see the um, um, Bahadur's rise, uh, the, the mutiny in 1850 where uh, Jangabadur went and led the entire Gurkha army to, to rescue the British from the, from, the, from the mutiny, for which he was rewarded with a visit to Britain in 1857, probably one of the first royalty from the subcontinent to visit UK. Um, and then the, the Rana Prime Ministers, one after another, who were the de facto rulers um, of Nepal. Um, the most important of which was probably Chanda Samsher, who, uh, who reigned the longest, 1903 to um, uh, 1929. Uh, his big achievement being the 1923 treaty between British India, uh, between Britain and Nepal. Uh, and from this, you can really see the, the First World War, 1914 to 1918, where the Ranas pledged uh, Nepali soldiers to the British Army. Uh, 20,000 of them were killed in, in, the, in the trenches of Belgium. In the Second World War, where the, the Nepali Gurkha soldiers were also here in Malaya, as well as uh, in Europe, another 22,000 killed at that time. And you could say that it was the, the blood spilt by uh, Gurkha soldiers that kept uh, Nepal independent from Britain. Um, and it was um, Chandra Samsaya's skillful diplomacy at that time in 1923 that allowed that treaty to happen. Um, but of course, the, the Ranas were Anglophiles, and being too close to Britain, it was inevitable that in 47, when the British left, uh, India that um, the Ranas also had to go. And so there began the, the whole democratic um, exercise. Um, first experimentations after 1950, the first elections uh, in 1960, and the famous picture of King Mahendra and the first elected Prime Minister B.P. Koirala sitting there um, at a time when Mahendra, uh, Mahendra said very famously that Nepal is not big enough for the two of us. So um, uh, parliament was dissolved, the prime minister was arrested, and Nepal's first experiment with democracy came to an end, and, um, and there began the 30-year period of the partyless system where uh, parties were banned, the, the press was controlled, um, there were periodic eruptions, but finally it was in 1990 that we had our first people power uprising on the streets, which led to the uh, transformation from absolute monarchy to constitutional monarchy in 1991 and the new constitution. 
The euphoria didn't last very long and soon Nepal was embroiled in a conflict with the Maoists starting their war in 1996. It lasted 10 years. So Nepal's history is, uh, is, um, is a history of periodic upheavals. Uh, this picture on the left is of the 1990 uh, democracy, pro-democracy protests on the streets and on the right, 2006. Um, so in between uh, those 16 years, you see the same student who in 1990 was protesting on the streets. She's now grown up, has children of her own, <laughs> but she's back on the street to, and the slogans are the same, we want democracy. Um, so we have to, we go through these periodic upheavals. And the, the strange infatuation with Mao, who is in his mausoleum in Beijing, and yet, right in China's backyard, he's alive and kicking with his ideology. And you can see some of the illustrious communists, philosophers, and leaders at the, at the back there with our own communist leaders in the front. Uh, and you can see even Kim Il-sung and Che Guevara. <laughs> um, so we live in a sort of a time capsule. And you could understand some of them, but even Stalin is there. So even he is revered. revered. Um, so the war, of course, was um, was really debilit. I mean, it, it, it destroyed the country's economy. Our development was pushed back 20 years. This is the first recruits into the uh, women's women into the Nepal army uh, during the conflict. The army's budget uh, grew threefold uh, during the during the conflict, of, um, which ended in uh, 2006, but uh, brutalized the country. It was. Ex um, large numbers of human rights violations, 90% um, uh, of the casualties, which was about 17,000 killed, were uh, civilians. Uh, in our newspapers, we got a sort of a ringside seat to recent history. Uh, we started in 2000. So you can see from the headlines, uh, from the very first edition on the left, um, right through the royal massacre of 2001, uh, to the war and the conflict, and then the post-conflict period, we've been covering um, events, uh, which include uh, things like the, the coup in 2005 by King Ganendra, who, took, who became king after the massacre, uh, the April 2000 end of the conflict, um, the ceasefire, uh, the first elections of 2008, and the dissolution of, meant of the monarchy by parliament. Uh, so Nepal becomes um, a secular republic. Uh, 2013, of course, the second um, constituent assembly elections. And we, at the moment, are in this period where, in the coming months, we are putting the final um, steps in place for the peace process with the new uh, constitution, new elections to a federal parliament, as well as um, provinces. And by January 8, January 21st, we're supposed to have our first new uh, parliament elected through the new constitution. So we're actually at the crossroads of history and the uh, and the f and and the final steps of the of the peace process that started in 2006. The peace process has now lasted longer than the war itself. Uh, as you know, the war ended in 2006, and we're now at 2017. Um, during those periods, of course, the media went through upheavals. This is um, the 2005 military coup by King Ganendra, where radio stations were and other media were, um, were suppressed um, by the state. Um, this is a page from our own Nepali language magazine, which you can see had been censored by the army. And we went to press with the white holes uh, on the page. So those, uh, those blank bits were the parts taken out by the army. Uh, and as you can see, the last paragraph, they only left the verb intact. Um, everything else was taken out. Cartoons, pictures, uh, stories were censored with, with the uh, soldiers sitting right behind you looking at the monitor before your paper went to press. So I've never seen such direct censorship before. I don't think you did even in the emergency. There was a bit of that. <laughs> Um, but you knew in 2006, during the protests, that the end of the monarchy was near when you saw scenes like these of a student wearing a fake crown 
uh, that said Republic on it. And when you see the faces of the, of the people all around and the ridicule with which um, the public regarded the, the monarchy, and especially the king, you knew that this was the beginning of the end. Uh, but probably the beginning of the end was the royal massacre itself in 2001, uh, which I think uh, reduced the respect uh, that the public had for the, the king and the monarchy. Uh, during all this um, suppression of the press, I think it was the cartoonists who carried the day. Um, of course, when the, the journalists and the radio reporters were silenced, it was the, the, the cartoonists in Nepal who really were very brave and uh, were, were making sketches like these for the papers, which for some reason would get through the censors uh, and sort of, I think, um, ended up really uh, contributing to the public's um, outpouring of anger. Then we come down to 2008 where the Maoists uh, who had come out by then um, uh, from the jungles into the interim government faced their first election, which they won with a landslide. Uh, so you can imagine a guerrilla army which had been fighting for 10 years comes out and uh, sweeps the election. It was very clear that even people who did not like the Maoists voted for them because it was not a really a vote for uh, the former guerrillas, it was a vote for peace. It was a way f to ensure that they didn't go back to the jungles. Um, and, and I think it worked in a lot of ways. Uh, the message got through. And um, so with that election, we enter a period of complete confusion, of uh, bickering between the parties, day-to-day -day politics, uh, corruption on the rise the political transition dragging on and on. Uh, and in the meantime, you were debating the Constitution and what kind of federalism we should have. So day-to-day -day politics got mixed up with the debate on the Constitution. And it really made the waters very, very murky. And what we had to deal with was this kind of a Nepal, where you have 123 ethnic groups. Um, and these are just 12 or 14 of the main ethnic groups. And so you can see that we live um, cheek to jowl, next to each other. Uh, it's all mixed up, uh, the original settlers with new settlers. Um, now, how do you make a federalism out of a, a mosaic like this was the main question. And of course, in a period of political transition, it became very populist to have a, a slogan and ethnic uh, agenda, flag waving politics and vote, vote bank politics based on ethnicity. Um, and there was a period in, in between 2010 to 2012 where it had, it had started getting really bad where I felt like my previous um, um, job as a correspondent in Sri Lanka where I had seen just two ethnic groups fight a 30-year war. We thought we were going into a very similar situation where we just didn't just have two ethnic groups, but we had like many, many, 123 in fact. So how do you deal, how do you, how do you, do you decentralize, devolve political power and, um, and, uh, and reduce the power of the center when you have such a cauldron and a mixture of, of different demands? So during those years, um, after 2008 to till today, we're still debating um, we're still debating uh, federalism, the way federal provinces should be demarcated, whether it should be ethnic or territorial or ecological even, or we should retain what we have today, which is a very geographical division of the country, north-south. Um, and various political parties, for various reasons, took their own positions on that. So on upper left, you have the model which is uh, more or less the sort of the Maoist model with the ethnic uh, groups uh, having their own um, provin provinces. You have on the, on, the, on the right, you have the demand of the Madesi parties which was for one Madesi, which meant that the entire plains area on the Tarai bordering India would be one big province by itself. Um, on the lower left, you have the more of the moderate compromise solution presented by the, the UML, which was um, sort of ethnicity-based, but as well 
as preserving their own both banks in Western Nepal and Eastern Nepal. Uh, and uh, the compromise solution we have today, along which we are having local elections at the present time, is the one on the bottom right, uh, where uh, basically the politicians and parliament has, has given up trying to give names to these provinces because it was so contentious because some people wanted ethnic names, others wanted uh, non-ethnic names. So we just named them by numbers. Um, so province one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and, and you can see the demarcation uh, with the six provinces also is, is a compromise of the, of the demands for territorial boundaries and ethnic boundaries. And it has now been decided by the commission that the names and the final demarcation and delineation should be done by the individual provinces once they have their own elections in November. So basically, they have passed the buck to the, the pro provincial councils. Of course, it's much more complicated than what I just told you. And I'm just giving you a summary. Um, so in the last, um, since 2008 elections, Nepal has been ruled by a three-party cartel of the three parties, the Nepali Congress, which is the center-right, the UML, the Communist Party UML, which is center-left, and the Maoists, who were extreme-left, but are now, uh, I don't think they know where they are. Um, um, so some would say that we are a three-party dictatorship, or maybe even a dictatorship of these three gentlemen in this cartoon, who is all from left to right, <coughs> KP Oli of the UML, uh, Prachanda Pushpakamal Dahal of the Maoist, and on the right, the current Prime Minister <coughs> of the Nepali Congress, who is um, Sherbada Deva. And the cartoon, of course, depicts the fact that Prachanda is essentially at the moment a kingmaker, although he's the third largest party in parliament. Um, he is the kingmaker because he has the swing vote. Um, so he used to be in a coalition with the UML and, uh, and Mr. Oli, and now he's jumped ship to come over to the current coalition with, uh, the, Ma with the Nepali Congress. Now, despite all this, in the last um, 20 years, despite all this turmoil, a war which killed 17,000 people, all this bad governance, lack of accountability, no local elections, despite all this, you have this amazing uh, situation where Nepal actually makes progress, where we, this is on, on, the, on this axis is the uh, extreme poverty line, and this is um, uh, the income level. So the percentage of people living below the poverty line in Nepal goes down very, very sharply, as you can see, much sharper than any most other countries in the region. Um, of course, we start from uh, from a very hard, but very a lot of poverty, in fact, about uh, maybe eighty percent. Um, but going down very sharply in that period in the last fifteen years. Um, and here you see uh, one of the most dramatic increases in the Human Development Index in Nepal, despite all these problems. So you you can imagine how far ahead Nepal could have been if there hadn't been a war, if um, things were more normal or if, um, if we had better governance or better accountability. Uh, this graph, of course, is the uh, Hans Rosling's uh, Gapminder um, analysis of Nepal's development. You can see if you take uh, lifespan as one of the indicators of development, um, uh, Nepal's pretty high up for a country with, with a very low income level. Um, so, it, it's quite surprising wh uh, why this has happened. No one can quite figure out why maternal mortality rate goes down from nearly 600 to 200 within 15 years, uh, or the poverty rate. Poverty rate, I guess, people have a conjecture that it is due to migration. The fact that 15 to 18 percent of Nepal's population at any given time is working abroad. Uh, more than 2 million in the Gulf, uh, 600,000 in Malaysia, uh, Japan, Korea, elsewhere. 
So the remittances they send back is, is one of the factors in the reduction of poverty. But female literacy is probably at the root of this because there's a direct inverse correlation between female literacy and all the other development parameters. So what the World Bank was saying in the 80s and 90s that you know every cent you invest in educating a girl is it got the highest rate of return, I think Nepal is a direct proof of that. Uh, and the map shows you the correlation for different parts of the country f between female literacy and child marriage. Um, uh, and child marriage has a lot of other implications. The uh, maternal mortality rate is related to, to early, early marriage, um, average marriage rate, age, and um, uh, the fact that, um, you know, how many children, the fertility rate. Um, so female literacy going up uh, very dramatically and the fertility rate from 5 to 2.6. So essentially, although we have a, a population momentum that will take us into growth for the next 30 years or so, uh, I don't have a graph of that, but we have met most of them except one or two, I think, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I think we're pretty well positioned on the MDGs, um, a bit like Bangladesh as well. I think a very dramatic progress despite problems. Uh, we do, uh, our paper and our publication does uh, public opinion polls, um, fairly well respected, um, um, almost every year for the last uh, 12, 13 years. But the most dramatic thing in this, can I get up again? Yeah, sure. Um, is, um, uh, maybe you can just. Uh, um, are these three graphs here, which you can't read, but uh, what these uh, darker um, graphs uh, show is if you have a question says which, who would you like to be prime minister? And these are the names of all the, you know, various leaders from the various parties, including those three dictators I talked about. These are all don't know, can't say, none of the above. So more than 60% of the respondents essentially don't like what's on offer. Uh, this is for the political parties. So. Do you, would you vote for Nepali Congress, UML, uh, Maoist, or any other party? These are all, um, so again, the same, same amount. We don't like them. And yet, when elections come around, we do vote for them, because probably because there's no alternative. And the same thing here. So that's why we call it the long tail, where you have this long tail of, of um, leaders and potential leaders who no one trusts. So uh, the field, actually, this graph shows is wide open for an alternative party, a bit like uh, India and the Aam Aadmi, you know, where an anti a party with an anti-corruption agenda, let's say an um, 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 egalitarian agenda, someone um, hopefully not populist, could really fill that vacuum at election time. But as we saw in the local elections that have just taken place, for some reason, people still go and vote for the traditional parties. I think it's loyalty to the party, their long uh, tradition of having um, an organization at the grassroots. Um, but what we did see in Kathmandu and Kathmandu Valley local elections this time was the rise to number three position of a completely unknown candidate till before local elections of a new alternative party a 22-year-old student who uh, stood for mayor, and um, and <coughs> although you know she came a pretty distant third, but still it was an extremely good showing for someone who was completely unknown and probably represented at least in the capital uh, a yearning for an alternative, younger, fresh, clean face. Uh, now whether this will translate into um, into um, the alternative parties doing better in, in November elections for federal and, uh, and the national parliament remains to be seen. They're organizing themselves uh, and they have also united. Two of the alternative parties have united into, into one, hopefully one more monolithic uh, alternative. Uh, we'll see how that goes and I think you should keep an eye on them. Uh, they have a green, environmental, uh, anti-corruption agenda. Um, one is called the Bibek Shil Nepal Party, and the other is the Saja Party. Uh, one of them, uh, the Saja Party led by a former journalist, 
um, who used to be with the BBC Nepali service, Ravindra Mishra, and the Bibek Shield party is, um, has um, Ranju Darshana, who was the um, mayoral candidate for Kathmandu, as well as uh, the party leader. And it's the, probably the only party in Nepal, Bibek Shield, which has a CEO. They actually have a chief executive officer. So it's run like a, uh, like a corporate thing and, um, and very well organized, extremely strong and, and exposed on, on social media. They're using uh, Facebook, Twitter, and their, and their own uh, sites to, to get uh, younger votes. Uh, so in the meantime, we've had all these other uh, disasters. Uh, the 2015 earthquake, of course, really shook things up. Uh, we saw how government can vanish when there's, an, when there's an earthquake. We saw none of our political leaders out for a month after the earthquake. They just disappeared. Uh, um, although it is, it is quite well known that disaster is a perfect opportunity for politicians to show that you know, they, can, they can deliver, they can, they can be right up there um, uh, well, meeting the, the people's relief needs. And yet our, our guys disappear. This is the cover picture in our paper of a baby who was rescued after 24 hours, um, in, you know, totally healthy, uh, miraculously rescued. And that's him two years later in the lower right. Uh, he's now two years old. Uh, and you can see behind him at the exact spot where he was rescued that his family's house is still in ruins. So this really points to the, uh, the delayed relief, um, uh, the fact that um, people have not got compensations, reconstruction is very slow, uh, and so on and so forth. Where reconstruction has not been so slow has been in the restoration of the temples and the monuments. Um, this is our centerfold from a month after the earthquake, uh, looking at how the monuments and the heritage sites in Kathmandu Valley were, were uh, destroyed. Uh, but here, the the reconstruction has um, has picked pace, picked up pace. Um, but five months after the earthquake, we had the uh, the blockade of the border, uh, which meant that uh, essential supplies, including relief uh, aid, could not get into Nepal uh, from India, and neither could all our imports that came through India. Um, this was probably uh, much worse for the economy than the earthquake was. Uh, because it affected the whole country. The earthquake was only 12 of the districts uh, surrounding Kathmandu. Um, but uh, the blockade did have an uh, impact on the, on the politics because the UML party really used it as a, as a, as a nationalist plank, um, uh, which meant that they did quite well in local elections in April and May. Um, this, the map shows you uh, the last local elections we had was 1997, so 20 years ago. So for 20 years, Nepal hadn't had local, for, sev for 17 years, we didn't have uh, local elected leaders like mayors and, and um, village council heads and so forth. Um, so after 20 years, we go finally back into elections, and this was the results of the, of the 1997 election, which you can see the red is the UML, and the UML had really um, had done very well in those elections. Um, the, um, uh, the, next, the, the last phase of the local elections is happening next week in province two, which is the one that has held out for amendments in the constitution, and they were not agreeing to taking part in elections until amendments uh, were, were introduced. Now they have decided now to finally go for elections and wait for the amendments to happen later. Um, but the, uh, the results of the first phase of elections were, showed that the UML was still doing very well. Uh, most of the mayors were, were elected, but much more than, uh, than who won, which party won local elections. I think it's very important to see that since this was the first local elections under the new constitution where there were provisions and reservations and quotas for women, for Dalits, and for indigenous peoples, uh, you could see that a lot of women uh, are now in local government. So this has been a real transformation in the, in the whole gender balance of governance at the local level. Uh, in Nepal's most patriarchal uh, municipality of Jumla in far western Nepal, which you see on the map, the mayor and the deputy mayor are both women. 
the constitution stipulates that if the mayor uh, if the mayor is a man the deputy mayor must be a woman but despite that the uh, mayor and deputy mayor both being women at least in three or four places now um, uh, there has been uh, quite a lot of changes also in the in the in the councils the ward councils and the village councils with uh, gender participation uh, the national parliament at the moment has 33% women which is one of the highest around the president is a woman uh, the speaker of the house is a woman and until recently the chief justice was a woman as well but everywhere else nepal is still a patriarchy uh, including the civil service um, so I think it will take time for the new constitution and the reservations to, to, to take effect. So, so far, as you can see, province two still hasn't had local elections, but you can see that the UML is leading in the local election results with the red is all, um, and the green is Nepali Congress. Pink is Maoist, but you can see they didn't do very well. And even in the 2013 national elections for the Constituent Assembly, they became the third party. They have now split into five five smaller pieces. Uh, their um, time in government was not um, very impressive, uh, so I think the people didn't really vote for them. Um, lately, and especially after the blockade, it's be really been a case of uh, a balancing act between India and China, and Nepal being caught right in the middle. Uh, the Doklam standoff um, put the spotlight on Bhutan, but it also uh, exposed Nepal's uh, role. Although we have a very small dispute at the tri-junction of our border between China, India, and Nepal, in Western Nepal, what we have seen is that uh, we seem to get um, shafted either way, when China and India are friendly, as well as when they are not so friendly. Uh, so um, India, India and China actually agreed on a disputed border which Nepal is claims it's its territory, that they divided it up among themselves. Uh, this is in the far western tip of Nepal. So for strategic reasons, they decided that they would decide on behalf of Nepal what to do with that. Uh, it shows that uh, completely different what happened in Doklam, which is, of course, uh, was, um, was resolved uh, two weeks ago, but still. Um, it showed that uh, the Himalayan border and the tensions along the disputed parts are in deep freeze at the moment, but could erupt at any moment in future if, if things get worse in, in uh, the relations between uh, India and China. And Bhutan and Nepal, of course, would be caught in the middle. Now, unlike Bhutan, which uh, nominally the foreign policy and defense is taken care of by India, uh, Nepal may seem to you like is more independent but in a lot of ways, we are more beholden. Um, largely because um, about 50,000 of our nationals serve in the Indian Army. And in the 1962 war, if you remember, um, five to 6,000 uh, casualties, of which a lot of them were Nepali national Gurkha soldiers fighting against um, um, on the on the Himalayan border. Now, I don't think there's any other country in the world today where a national of one country fights in the army of another against another neighbor of which you are friends with. So Nepal is friendly with both China and India. Our soldiers are in the Indian army fighting another f friend or friendly country. So uh, this is uh, quite an anomalous situation, but what is surprising is the lack of um, that, that the lack of surprise in Nepal that this is the situation, that we take it as a given. And maybe we take it as a given because it has been a tradition since 1816 that our soldiers were in the British Army, or in the Singapore police, or in the, the Sultan of Brunei's palace guards. Uh, so basically, Nepal supplies mercenaries, and it is not taken as an anomalous situation uh, within Nepal, and it is not a political issue. It's not the Maoists did have in one of their demands when they fought the war that foreign recruitment of our soldiers should be banned, but of course, when they came into power, they found it politically untenable 
to, to follow through with that. So it continues. Uh, 7,000 in the British Army today, uh, some of them in Afghanistan till recently. Um, um, of course, uh, Singapore police, um, the Oman Palace Guards, um, and even more incongruous is the fact that the British Army, on behalf of the Brunei um, uh, police and the Oman police, will recruit Nepali soldiers on behalf of Oman and Brunei, and to a certain extent Singapore as well. Now, how does this work? Uh, we have no idea, but we write stories on it from time to time, but there's almost a complete lack of interest in this. And probably the reason is the remittances that come from uh, Gurkha retired soldiers, um, uh, the ones who go back home, or the, or the money sent home by, by retired soldiers. So um, the earthquake was a, a natural disaster, although I think the, the high casualty rate of 9,000 people killed, probably because buildings were shoddy. We didn't have seismic resistant houses. So in a way, it was a man-made disaster. But a, but a more long-term disaster is unfolding in Nepal, and that is to do with climate change. This lake uh, near Mount Everest is only 15 years old. In trekking and mountaineering maps of the Everest region from 30 years ago, there is a glacier there. Um, uh, climate change, global warming, is melting the mountains before our eyes. It's happening within a generation. Uh, if you talk to uh, yak herders up in uh, up in uh, Kumbu with the Sherpas there, they remember as children they saw the snow right down to where their village was and now of course it's up way high up in the mountains and it can be seen everywhere this is a picture taken from the Mallory expedition 1921 of the north side of Cho Yu which is near Everest and uh, a picture taken 2009 and that lake is now even bigger than 2009 so you can see not just the retreat of the glacier and the, and, and the glacier being replaced by a lake, but also the shrinking of the thickness of the ice. And this is happening right across the mountains in especially eastern Nepal, Bhutan, and southern Tibet. And a lot of these rivers are, of course, transboundary rivers, which means the Kosi, for example, starts in China, comes through Nepal, and goes into India. So this has... Um, very uh, serious implications for long-term water uh, supply uh, for Nepal and for India as well. And, and as because they flow through India into Bangladesh for Bangladesh as well. Uh, some of the lakes are really dangerous, like this one. Uh, there are about 200 lakes that are now been mapped, which are uh, held back by very fragile uh, moraine dams, uh, which are just sand and boulders. Uh, which could collapse um, you know, by itself or just the pressure of the water or in a future earthquake. We were very lucky in 2015 that none of these lakes burst, but the, a simultaneous bursting of these lakes could, could unleash a Himalayan uh, tsunami coming right down the rivers because they would then funnel right into the main rivers and flow into India. Uh, so this is something we have to take very seriously. The, the global warming is being the process has been accelerated by the deposition of soot particles from pollution from the Indo-Gangetic plains in the snows, which has um, accelerated the melting of the snows because of the loss of the albedo effect. Uh, this is not a Nepal problem. This is a regional problem. As, and as you can see, it, it affects uh, everything from the Arabian Sea to the South China Sea or, or the North China Sea. Uh, the main rivers of China begin in eastern Tibet, and eastern Tibet is melting fast. The permafrost is melting on the plateau. Um, and you can see there that the Indus and the Ganges and the Brahmaputra start within 50 kilometers of each other near M Mansarovar Lake in western Tibet. And they all flow down either to the Arabian Sea or to the Bay of Bengal. Uh, how these uh, rivers will behave in the dry season in the coming 35 years, uh, computer simulations have shown that they'll actually rise, the water level will rise during the spring thaw uh, for the next 35 years as the permanent snow and ice melts. But after that, we're looking at very dry rivers in the dry season. 
Um, and what happened in Nepal, Bihar, and Bangladesh this year was unprecedented. Uh, some scientists have linked it to climate change, but um, a lot of the disaster was actually man-made because of embankments, uh, roads that were built without proper uh, attention given to drainage of the rivers along the floodplains. Um, the loss of life, 1,500 throughout the region killed, uh, was quite high compared to uh, recent floods and the inundation, uh, the amount of inundation in Bangladesh, more than 30% of the land area covered in water, 20% uh, of Nepal's entire national population affected by floods. Uh, this is huge and the headlines of course were all about Houston, but right in our own countries and uh, in our own backyards we had a much, much bigger uh, disaster. Um, um, a schoolgirl, grade five, drying her textbooks because she was so eager to go back to school after the floods. A uh, picture that we carried in our paper. So challenges remain. Um, I think the first uh, one is to make democracy work with our new constitution. Uh, I think we're learning that fighting for democracy is easier than making it work. Um, and we have to we have kept on fighting for it and preserving it, and it, it happens all the time. There have been, even with elected governments, there have been attacks on the press, uh, attacks on civil society activists. Um, rebuilding is harder, either rebuilding after a conflict or rebuilding after earthquakes or floods. Um, protecting media freedom so that it is not jeopardized by warlords and demagogues, even uh, elected ones. Um, constitutional amendments, we need those in place before the November elections. Um, I think we need to turn people power into, into long-term peace and sustainable peace, which means being more inclusive, uh, addressing the grievances of the excluded and the neglected, um, uh, and the parliament with its uh, new composition hopefully will, will be able to do that and improve governance. We already see an improvement in governance after the local elections. We, in our paper, did a comparative study of how flood relief in the last, last two weeks was handled in areas where there had been local elections recently and where, in province two, where elections haven't yet happened. And we found that flood relief was much more streamlined and smoothly delivered in areas which now had local elected leaders, which means accountability was, was better. Uh, and of course, uh, the end goal of all this is to kickstart the economy, which has been in the doldrums for too long, and, um, and largely because of the instability, the lack of investment, because, of the, because there is no continuity in government policy on FDIs and so forth. Uh, otherwise, we could repeat what was starting to happen in the early 90s, which was a attracting Indian and other multinationals to Nepal to set up shop for, uh, for export-oriented growth. Um, I'll leave you with this last slide to decide who is what. Uh, but I think uh, it's pretty clear that the mouse is Nepal, or, <laughs> or Bhutan, or Singapore. Um, but there are the big boys around. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kunda, for a very rich talk. I think we have plenty of food for thought from you know, Nepal's uh, being possibly the first nation state in South Asia to the, 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 the birth pangs of Nepal transitioning to a constitutional democracy to Nepali soldiers serving abroad, both in the army and police, as well as delicate balancing acts that uh, Nepal has to play between India and China. And finally, the, the, the comments about climate change and the huge impact that it has on Nepal. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. Maybe we'll take two or three at a time because there are, I assume, many questions. Uh, Professor Mitra, uh, Surya Narayan, and Sojin for the first round. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Half the way, I thought, where is Nepal going? <laughs> and then, we discover it is still going. Um, <laughs> I speak now um, as director of the institute 
of South Asian studies which has a vested interest. Our vested interest, I'm now speaking from Singapore, in South Asia is to find stability, peace, and uh, ease of business because Singapore wants to connect and do business. So half the talk shows why none of this is possible and the other half shows it is actually happening. So I want to know from you what holds Nepal together, who holds Nepal together, and what makes Nepal work. I ask this question as a student of comparative politics of transition to democracy. I work on state formation in South Asia. I could answer this question for India. In India, it was happening towards the early part of the 19th century, and an elite, a comprador elite, was growing, which was pulling together locality, region, and nation, competing and collaborating with imperial rule. Mm. That was the cohesive stuff, and that is how it continues. Now, if I look at Nepal from India and answer my own question, I only see absences and discontinuities. Mm. And yet, when I see that little mouse, <laughs> I know what it's about. <laughs> and uh, I would be, as a student of democracy theory, state formation, and transition, I'll be dreadfully keen to get your answer. Thank you. Okay. Could we just it won't be an academic answer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in the next round, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Surya? Uh, this is a bit on foreign policy about the Belt and Road Initiative of China and, you know, when Nepal was present at the summit, uh, what are the projects uh, which China has discussed with Nepal and what kind of uh, response Nepal has given? And also about the Nepal-India-China Thai junction, what is Nepalese position? I'm curious to know. Thank you. Okay, the final question of this round, Sojin. Um, hello, uh, my name is Sojin from South Korea, but working on, on the political economy of uh, development in South Asia. And in fact, um, Pukhara is my favorite city in South Asia. And um, for, uh, fortunately, I have seen the democratic uh, transition very shortly in 2008, mm -hmm. just before the first election. And I was I was staying in Kathmandu for uh, uh, for a month, and then I went to Bukhara. But I could see a lot of difference between how political parties were mobilizing people on the ground. But in, in, in uh, Kathmandu, I was uh, looking at the the all different political parties, you know, how they uh, came to the street and mobilized the people for the election. I was very impressed, though Nepal by then uh, didn't have much experience with the democracy. And my question is about um, about the source of uh, democratic transition in Nepal. I mean, how would you see, I mean, do you think the source of democratic transition comes from uh, the endogenous factors like uh, uh, you know, regional leaders coming up uh, with uh, having an idea of like democracy, or or increasing. I mean, uh, um, civil society strengthening uh, from all other you know different sources, or exogenous like factor like you know the NGOs mm -hmm. having the global connections with like international organizations. Like if you look at the the natural disasters disasters uh, you know I mean happening sometimes in Nepal quite often in South Asian countries. I mean, uh, the first comers to, to help, um, you know, the local people for restoration is always like foreign, you know, mm -hmm. like NGOs having the foreign connections. I mean, do they have some like important, uh, you know, influence uh, for that democratic transition? That's mm -hmm. my question, thank you. Wow. Yeah. Oof. A lot of questions. And <laughs> um, you know, as journalists, we're used to being on that side and grilling the person <laughs> on the photo. <laughs> The tables have turned. I know you're taking your revenge. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, to answer your first question, that's really, that's, a, that's heavy. I mean, uh, what holds Nepal together and um, what makes Nepal work? Well, it's not working. And I think partly it's because we still have to find the answer to the first question, which is what holds Nepal together? It used to be the monarchy. Uh, with the monarchy gone, it is, I think, it is, uh, it is a shared history, the fact that we have this long history of independence, uh, and the language. 
And I think, uh, and as you know, Nepali is not just spoken in Nepal. There are five million people in India who speak Nepali mm -hmm. as well. So it's not just our language. It's a language that, that spans South Asia as well. Um, so I would say uh, today, with the new constitution, if you look at our preamble and, and the way it has gone for the last 10 years, I think um, our unity is our diversity. I mean, I know it's a cliche. But the 123 ethnic groups, the 99 languages that are spoken in this relatively small country compared to India, uh, that we have such enormous uh, human diversity, uh, linguistic diversity, cultural diversity in a, in a much smaller country than India, is I think if we can address that, come to terms with it, and to uh, internalize it in our politics, that's where our strength will be. Um, but so far, unfortunately, it's been about division. About because it has been suppressed for so long, it's just erupting. But we have to put the genie back in the bottle and make it work as a, as a functioning nation state. And uh, and I think the uh, what we're seeing today is this this churning that comes out of decades and centuries of of being uh, of, of being suppressed. Um, but despite everything. Uh, the peace process. Look at our peace process. I mean, why did it work? Uh, a war that had lasted 10 years, which till a few months before it ended looked like it was going to last for another 20, um, was resolved. Um, the peace process, I mean, the 1,700 guerrillas from the Maoist army have been inducted into the national army. Where else in the world has that happened except maybe one or two? And, and, and very smoothly done. Um, uh, the rest of the Maoist army have been uh, compensated and, and allowed to go. Um, so a lot of things have worked. I mean, even our transition from tra constitutional monarchy, sorry, from monarchy to republic has been quite civilized. And we didn't behead the king. I mean, he held a press conference in the royal palace. Uh, yeah, no, he, yeah. But, uh, you know, he held a press conference at the Royal Palace after Parliament, I mean, a few hours after Parliament said that the monarchy is dead. And he said, okay, bye-bye, I'm off, and he was off. And he's now living happily ever after in, in, in Kathmandu. Um, you know, we didn't ransack the palace, we turned into a museum. Uh, we didn't hound our king into exile like some of the others have done. So, you know, I mean, if you look through all this, it's, it's, uh, there's actually a forward movement. And the Constitution is progressive, so hopefully we'll be addressing some of those uh, issues. And, and looking at it from India, I think, I think ne uh, Nepalis take, um, are too sensitive to what India's feelings are. We think that India is totally always obsessed with what's happening in Nepal. Of course, India has other concerns. Uh, but we have this feeling, and almost, I think it comes from our own insecurity um, about what India intends to do. And I think we have to get over that. Uh, and, and, and things like the blockade don't help. You know, it just, it just feeds into that whole uh, paranoia. Um, Belt and Road, uh, yeah, um, I think um, what we'd really like is not just one, not one belt, one road, but maybe one belt and many roads. <laughs> and actually, Nepal does not fall into that those two tracks, the maritime and the, of course, maritime not because we're landlocked, but even the, uh, even the uh, China to Europe, um, you know, corridor doesn't touch the Himalaya. In fact, the Himalaya is the big barrier. But I think what China would really like to do is have a land route, a train route, uh, via Nepal uh, to the Indian Plains. I think probably to facilitate trade and, and other things. And, and as a first step to that, They've already extended the, uh, the railroad, railroad up to Sigatse. <coughs> They're extending it, uh, they say, in the next two or three years up to Kerung. And Kerung, of course, is this new uh, border point after the earthquake destroyed the previous one in Kodari. They've m moved to Kerung. Uh, geographically, it's very strange that Nepal has the, has the main rivers, which I said was, you know, they're older than the mountains, so they cut through the mountains. That's what gives Nepal the access to the plateau. Uh, so any railroad, roads, have to follow these rivers into the plateau. And 
nowhere else except maybe the Ganges also but the, the gorges there are really really narrow but the Nepal um, from Nepal to Tibet the, the, the rivers uh, are actually um, can be turned into corridors for roads and railroads and so the Kerung road is along a river that starts in Tibet and snakes into uh, near Kathmandu so that would be the logically the best way uh, in uh, and of course that is also the point on the, on, the, on the map of Nepal, if you see the narrowest part of Nepal is right there where Kerung is on the north and the Indian border is right to the south. It's only about 80 to 85 kilometers. Um, so that would be a natural corridor in case uh, there is um, more surface trade between India and, and China. But, uh, but economists have told me that it's actually much cheaper to bring things by ship uh, per ton, it's actually going to be really expensive, even if you have a railroad uh, to take goods from uh, China to uh, to uh, India via uh, Nepal, a railroad through Nepal. So I don't know how that's going to play out, but um, definitely it would benefit Nepal um, uh, to be in such a strategic position uh, for future trade. And, and I think no one has really articulated it uh, in Nepal that way, but I think our aim is that China and India become two locomotives that would pull us along uh, as they grow. But so far it has not been the case. In fact, sometimes it's been the case that the locomotives are pulling on opposite directions, as happened during the blockade, where Nepal tried to make, um, uh, you know, tried to make, convince China that they should help us, but of course half-heartedly, and also China's um, gestures were more symbolic than anything else, uh, 1,000 tons of petroleum. Uh, and of course, and that there, there, are no, there is no infrastructure to facilitate help from the mainland across the Himalaya to Nepal from, from the north. So um, I think the geopolitical reality and the topographical reality is that we'll have to keep on depending on the, on the south for um, for trade and, and, and future economic cooperation. Uh, China will be there, but I don't think China is also in a position to jeopardize its relations with India over Nepal. Uh, and I think that's been the unspoken doctrine uh, so far. Um, what was that? Oh, uh, the Lipu, Lipu Lake, tri-junction. Nepal's position, of course, is that it's ours. There's a lot of nationalism about it. The UML has been uh, picking that up, and there's been a lot of in fact, the only time I would think in the last seven, eight years, and some of the Nepali journalists here can correct me, the only time Nepali media or Nepali public has been irritated with China re in recent years has been over that agreement with India over Lipu Lake. They said, oh, we thought they were our friends and they've ditched us. That kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, op-ed pieces and things like that. So, in general, Nepali media is extremely um, soft on China, and uh, but that was one point where it, it, it we we I mean the media and to some extent the public felt that um, that China wasn't helping us in that dispute. Um, Pokhara, source of the transition democracy. I don't know if I understood your question uh, well, but. I think um, I think there's a great deal of public support for an open society in Nepal. I think the fact that we keep periodically having to fight for freedom against all kinds of dictators in the past means that uh, it's just that it's not organized, that, that, that yearning for an open society and democracy and press freedom is not organized um, in any sort of concrete way. The political parties are supposed to articulate it, um, and they do so. So whenever there is an uprising against uh, uh, the king or any other uh, ruler, it has been the political parties that have been at the, uh, the forefront with civil society helping out um, from the side. Um, but civil society at the moment is hopelessly divided, polarized. Uh, the political parties, of course, have forgotten the whole ideology about why it was that they were fighting for freedom in the first place, uh, and it's become a, a, a three-party dictatorship, which means that it's all about power and power sharing and backroom deals. Um, so, uh, although it may look like when you read the headlines of the papers in Kathmandu that 
oh, they're always fighting each other and clawing at each other and undermining each other. But actually, when the three leaders go into their back rooms for their dealings about power sharing, they are best friends. And, uh, and, and the way this whole coalition um, shuttle has happened, which meant that um, the, the Maoist UML coalition led to the Maoist Congress coalition with the, Cong with the Maoist jumping ship, was done all in these backroom deals. And the fact that Prachanda had agreed with Deoba that he would serve for nine months and then Deoba would take over after nine months, I mean, he kept his promise. And, and that's how it was done. There's nothing democratic about it. So yes, we have a bedrock of uh, democracy, and hopefully that, that foundation will be strengthened with the Constitution. But unfortunately, I think on the surface, it's, it's, it's very fluid and very, um, it's, 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 it's still rent-seeking, and it's all about uh, power and, and, the, and the resources that can be at the command of those in power, especially at election time. Uh, to fill up your watches, your party's watches, or your own, uh, you know, election expenses. Um, so, in a way, uh, democracy has been practiced, but very cynically, by our leaders. Which is why, and it's reflected in the public opinion polls, and which is why the the arena is wide open for an alternative, credible alternative party. Maybe not immediately now in the uh, in the November elections, but definitely in the ones after that. We can have the next uh, round with Dr. Chaudhary, Dr. Subarao, and Jivant, all from my side. Thanks for an excellent expose. Uh, I mean, we uh, in Bangladesh, for instance, have a lot to learn from calling, even from the very beginning. We say the same about Bangladesh. <laughs> <laughs> because I remember, you know, the Leo Rose text on, mm. on how to conduct uh, a, a diplomacy without being Finlandized. Yeah. I mean, this is something that yeah. uh, we got from Nepal. And in fact, even domestically, uh, Sojin was talking about Pokhara. Mm -hmm. I remember our first negotiations on local government, etc. learning from Nepal, was a session with the Anchaladish mm -hmm. of Pokhara. Okay. Anyway, uh, uh, one comment, a question. The comment is, I was not very surprised in what you said about develop, uh, development indices of Nepal. I've chaired the LDC for, mm -hmm. for many years, and eventually we shared with Nepal. And uh, in the WTO, I championed mm -hmm. Nepal's uh, inclusion. Mm -hmm. I remember there were 365 questions asked of Nepal. I didn't chair the negotiations because I wanted to support it from outside. And I was very impressed, I must say, by the way, the Nepalese handled, mm -hmm. handled, handled these questions. Now. Uh, the the the, uh, the uh, question is with regard to the domestic politics, and sometimes you've wondered, and certainly I have, isn't there any possibility of a grand coalition between the Nepali Congress and UML? I mean, is it thought of? Are people like you sort of uh, reflecting on it, uh, drawing lessons from European experiences, etc.? Hmm. Oh, Dr. Subara. Uh, thank you. My name is Subaro. I'm a visiting research fellow here. Thank you for a very interesting and comprehensive talk. I learned a lot. My comment and question have to do with decentralization. I can quite relate to your experience that the debate on decentralization in the constitution making was very contentious and acrimonious. And that's not surprising because decentralization is one of the most significant but also one of the most complex governance reforms across the world. Uh, rich countries, poor countries, developed, developing countries, everybody is struggling with decentralization. Mm. America, Canada, Australia, mm. Ethiopia, Mexico, Brazil, mm. China, yeah. India. Now I just want to give you, take a minute to give you India's experience. Before the 91 reforms, there was a lot of effort by the central government to attain regional equity. So they, in the industrial licensing mm. and public sector investment, they would go to backward areas. Some ineffective, but definitely a deliberate attempt to attain regional equity. The 1991 reforms destroyed that mm. because we went to a market base. And the story then was that if you draw a line from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, India was divided into two. Mm. On the west of the line are states which could take advantage mm. of the market. 
yeah, and therefore so. would develop faster. And then east of the line, the states which could not exploit the market and therefore would fall further backward. And that did indeed happen for some time. So we had an east-west divide. Then in the later 90s and early 2000s, we had a north-south divide. You know, the southern mm. states moving mm. faster and the northern states staying behind. And now we're all over the map. You know, like Bihar is the mm. fastest growing yeah. state in the country today, like Nepal, mm. because it's starting from a low base. That mm. doesn't mean mm. much. Now, to, you know, in some sense you can have any formula. You can have one, two, three, four, five, six, or any name or whatever. Ultimately, in decentralization, geography is destiny. Mm. Right? You have to yeah. have a contiguous region. But the problem is that contiguous regions may not be equally economically viable. Mm. So you have to have some form of uh, resources going from the center to the states, and mm. that can be a very, very difficult acrimonious formula. That's my comment. Here's mm. the question. Could you not have postponed decentralization for 10 years? <laughs> no, agreed that, look, we will have, we'll move to democracy, we'll agree on a tentative constitution, uh, work on development, and defer this for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the final question uh, of this Thank you very much. It's been a very interesting and illuminating talk. Thank you. I envy the capacity of, I mean, I think all academics could learn from your <laughs> way of presenting. Um, uh, I, I wanted to know, have there been any interesting developments in terms of relations uh, between Nepal and the other South Asian countries? Because we had a workshop recently on the failure, the fate, the future of SARC. Mm. And one allegation was that it's always India and it's always the India-Pakistan problem that holds up SARC. But why don't the other South Asian states just get on with it? Mm. So is there any signs of that? Or are all the South Asian states essentially obsessed with great power politics? Yeah, maybe take the last one first. <laughs> Uh, I think that, you know, it's actually BIMSTEC that has become more active now than SARC. Um, they just had a meeting and uh, foreign ministers in Kathmandu, they, they seem to have an agenda, it's like a sub-regional grouping. Um, so it's, um, um, SARC is, I think, just held hostage by the India-Pakistan thing. You know, uh, I mean, all SARC summits, look at what the journalists cover in a SARC summit, it's always that, that handshake you know, <laughs> between the Indian and the Pakistani leaders. And I think it's also because the smaller states have not been able to um, get together to do things on their own. Um, but it's also determined by geography. India borders all the Sark nations, whereas none of the Sark nations border each other. Uh, and that's the anomaly of the, of the situation. And. Um, the fact that to fly to the Maldives, which is a SARC member from Kathmandu, you have to come all the way to Singapore, or to go to Doha, to go to Colombo. There's no direct flights, um, and and that's just flights. But land routes, uh, train, um, you know, connections, of course, non-existent. Um, so it's uh, it, it's it's a question of connectivity, um, which is where we could have really started working. Uh, visa regimes, making it very easy for SARC members, which has now happened, but there are some SARC members will not take, uh, will not give you visas for other SARC nations, depending on their, you know, where they are. So a um, lot could have been done, and we don't do enough because I think we are held hostage by this larger polarity within South Asia. Um, SARC secretary generals tend not to be the most dynamic people. They used to be in the old days, not anymore. Uh, they tend to be just someone sent from the foreign ministry of each country on a ro rotational basis. Uh, and maybe they're not allowed to take the leadership role that they could. Uh, so it's become even less effective than the UN system. Uh, so, uh, I don't know how to rescue that. I think it needs political will or maybe some kind of a long-term resolution of the, of the India-Pakistan uh, dispute. I don't see any other way. Um, it could be trade and, and um, other things, like, but then South Asian countries trade more with non-South Asians than with each other. Um, and even India-Pakistan trade, which happens, by the way, uh, is through Dubai, right? 
It's, it's, um, it's not even across the border. So um, uh, second, I think the, the other question on decentralization, um, um, we could postpone it by 10 years, we could have, and I think, in fact, that was one of the lines we took in our editorial position. But it, the whole question of decentralization got mixed up with the demand for federalism, which in turn was pushed by the demand for, from the uh, Madhesi, based parties for autonomy for the plains. So because it was all so tied up with, uh, with uh, addressing long-term discrimination and grievances of a particular uh, ethnic group with, uh, with a territorial home base, it had to be done. In fact, it was a fait accompli. I think we saw in, 20, well, in this last two or three years that federalism, however much Nepal is not prepared for it, was a fait accompli. So uh, the way out of it was to do that demarcation of one, two, three, four, five, six. First, not name it. Secondly, have um, boundaries that more or less reflected ethnicity, but actually were not. Uh, and, and also a lot of gerrymandering by the political parties, depending on where their home bases were. Uh, so uh, that would be the ideal situation. I think we're not yet ready in a, in a country our size for the kind of federalism that is demanded. In fact, the cost of it is going to be astronomical. The chief ministers, the, the local the provincial assemblies, and, and it's actually going to be anti-decentralization, federalism is, because the chief ministers in the new federal provinces are going to be more centralized than Kathmandu ever was. They'll want to keep the power to themselves. And even after this local election, we've seen a bill in parliament which wants to actually choke off the money supply to recently elected local units of government so that they will not have the power. They will not have the power because they won't have the money to spend. So they're, they're sort of changing the rules of the game after the elections have happened, after local governments have come into place by saying that, okay, you can only take certain percentage of the taxes locally. So they will not, they will not have the resources to push local development projects, which was the whole idea of, of decentralization and, and self-governance. So uh, yeah, unfortunately, I think we're taking two steps back on, on, on that if this bill is passed. Uh, so ideally, yes, 10 years later. But, um, but I think we're, we're stuck with it for now. I don't think there's a way to pull back now from federal elections. It just become politically untenable to do so. Um, uh, your question, whose question was that? Grand Coalition. Oh, the Grand Coalition. We've had uh, NCUML coalitions in the past. But since 1990, Nepal has been this two-party state where it was the NC and the UML. And the rivalry between them for uh, rent-seeking, for uh, positions, for control of the bureaucracy, for control of the budget has been so strong and deep that uh, in the old days, we used to make fun of it because uh, planes of Nepal Airlines would not fly because the pilot was a Nepali Congress and the co-pilot was a <laughs> UML. And they would have uh, fights in the cockpit. Um, but this was reflected everywhere. I mean, it's just like, it's it just very, very deep. And this was a result of the democracy movement of 1990 that it polarized the country between these two parties. And still, today, we're back to that because the Maoists, which was the alternative party and was strong, is now split into so many different pieces and they, and they just don't have the, the electorate uh, backing to be that alternative. So that's why Prachanda plays, plays kingmaker by, by, you know, flip-flopping between one side or the other. Um, but I think uh, whenever Nepal has been governed well, it has been at times when we had national governments. And a bit like Bangladesh, when you had election governments, or Pakistan, when you had uh, Moin Qureshi, was it? Or, you know. Moin Qureshi in Pakistan. Yeah. So uh, when, when the, the national agenda takes priority, where partisan interests sort of uh, take a back, uh, back seat. And so <laughs> it's really ironical that in our democracies, democracy works best when you have an unelected government. 
Okay, uh, the, the final round of questions, Anish, the gentleman at the back, and oh, another one, okay. So these questions have to be very short. We have only 10 minutes left. Okay, my name is Anish Vishal. I'll keep the question short. Okay. Um, firstly, brilliant use of cartoons in the presentation. I would like to bring your attention to one cartoon which is on the balancing act, you know, the one where, you know, the Nepali hold the India and uh, China flag. So, if, as we look in South Asia, Nepal is not the, the only country in this position. This exact image can be drawn for Bangladesh and Sri Lanka as well. Mm. And pardon me for saying this, but there's a common view of South is that South ultimately is about the Commonwealth countries of South. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, and the others are just the uh, sidekicks. <laughs> so there's, uh, yeah, uh, sorry for saying this, but that's, that's why there's li little that Nepal can do in Sark. But what I feel is that how about, you know, um, Nepal further developing its bi um, bilateral relations with Sri Lanka and Bangladesh well, yeah, like to, to meet the, the common objective of um, doing the balancing act and as, as a t at the same time um, rejecting Indian hegemony in South Asia. Thank you. Yeah, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, I'm Santos. I'm a student at RSS NTU. And I'm one of those who came here looking at the topic, and that sounds very fascinating. And but thank you, you for your presentation <laughs> on your on overall picture of Nepal. Uh, first of all, just a bit of correction. In one of those maps, it had shown the final number of provinces in Nepal was six. It's actually mm. seven. Mm. That missed the far western region. Oh. Uh, so know. that's just the correction for all. Uh, secondly, I think uh, the title itself, Between a Rock and a Hard Place, these are two of our oldest neighbors with whom we have the most communication. Why is it that we still see them as a rock and a hard place, which are very negative connotations with that? And just to follow up with the balancing thing, uh, I have heard a lot of this, even in Nepalese media and Nepalese leaders talking about balancing, balancing, balancing all the time. And it sounds sexy, and I know that balance can almost never be a wrong word. But what do we really mean when we say balancing? Is it the balance of power? Is it the balance of influence? Is it the balance of trade? Or is it something else altogether? Thank you. Thanks. OK, the last two questions, you and then me. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Lam Chi Chung. I'm in, in investment management. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, the Maoists. Um, the, you say that they, they now seem they are all over the map. Uh, ideologically, they can go with the center right, they can go with the center left. Um, but at one time, so the, you know, the, the fact that they could fight a, a, a guerrilla war, and would, would they not have been quite ideologically committed at that point, or would they just simply uh, disenfranchise and they were once again to power? Then they can, you know, so you can talk a bit about that. Um, I also wanted to ask you a historical question. Um, you mentioned that the about how you know the the center it, it's hard for the center to hold because of all this ethnic diversity. Um, but at one time, Nepal was strong enough to be the only state to hold off the British. So, mm. pr so was it a much stronger state then, um, or was it just that you know it had the mountains <coughs> to protect it, and the British weren't really that interested in it anyway? Mm. Yeah. yeah. And the owner of the last question is to you. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. My name is Masahiro. I think I am the, I'm not the academic person. I'm from the Masi Relief, a local human and relief organization working in Nepal. Uh, so the, now the general election is coming in November and December. What could be the uh, impl uh, implication or the uh, the impact is expected to the development or the reconstruction effort in that area. Okay. This is the first question. Mm -hmm. The second question is, I think that two, one or two months ago, uh, Nepal was uh, reported as one of the uh, emerging economy in the world, six or seven percent of the, the growth. economic growth. And then the, you say that uh, development indicator is improving, but you say that the national politics are handled by three parties, those among our uh, best friends. Mm. I couldn't see the, uh, the Nepal in one picture. Would you explain that mm. these are okay. Those are the questions. Okay, um, I think the, taking the last one first, um, the reconstruction will, of after the earthquake you mean, and also maybe the flood relief after the floods, it'll be determined more by uh, local governments than by the national government. 
I think the national government will have less say after these uh, November, December elections in the reconstruction process. And as I said earlier, the, even the earthquake relief has now got speeded up because there are now village councils that are elected, the mayors that are elected uh, recently, who have now decided that, who have now been forced by public pressure to start acting on it. And so um, before local elections in April, you had a very centralized uh, relief and rehabilitation um, process controlled by the National Reconstruction Authority. And uh, it just became too, too centralized, too unwieldy, and, and it didn't have time to go into all the districts uh, by itself. So with a, with a more decentralized governance process, I think it'll be, it'll be faster. So it won't depend so much on November, but already you can see impact of local elections uh, in, in the reconstruction. I don't know if you've seen it in your projects, but uh, from our reporters, what we've seen is that there is real pressure now on local elected local governments to deliver quickly uh, because it's now been nearly three years since the earthquake and some many people are still living out in the open. Um, um, uh, what was the other question after that? Was the, uh, the three parties. Yeah, the, 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 I think the 7% growth is now being revised after the floods because uh, the crops and the livestock loss was huge, enormous. Mm -hmm. And since uh, the eastern Tarai, where the floods hit the worst, is also a grain basket, it means that, uh, and especially is the rains, either the lack of it or too much of it, that affects our, uh, our annual economic national growth rate. So I think it'll probably be revised down to 5 or maybe even 4.5% in the coming year. Now, um, yes, the economy is doing better, development, we're making progress, but politics is stuck. And hopefully the new parliament, smaller parliament, will be less unwieldy and there will be, be um, greater accountability with maybe a challenge from the alternative parties to keep the big three on their toes. Uh, and and uh, that's the only thing we can hope for at the moment because I don't think the alternative parties will have any kind of majority to be forming government very soon. Uh, but their role will be in the parliament committees, public accounts committee and the national resource committee the Water Resource Energy Committee and so forth. Uh, Maoists um, and the British. Okay, uh, the reason uh, the British Quebec wanted Nepal, of course, because it was too hot in India. So they wanted hill stations. And that's why Darjeeling and Shimla and Dharmasala and all that. But the real reason um, historians have now uh, sort of uh, theorized is that the British, it's not the British government that was in India till 1857. It was the East India Company, which would be like today if India was ruled by BP, you know, a multinational that had shareholders in London. And there were basically, the government had given it on contract for a multinational company to run an entire subcontinent. And that's how it is run. So their main interest was trade. And so what were they trading for? What were they looking for? The most precious commodity at that time, by weight, was uh, the shawl, shawls and wool made from the chest hair of baby antelopes living in Western Tibet. Okay, so the trade routes to Western Tibet was through the Himalaya in Western Nepal and maybe even uh, Kathmandu. Uh, so to get to that, to trade that, that's when they wanted. Of course, also the Gorkha Kingdom at that time was belligerent, it was expansionist, they were challenging the East India Company. So there was this rivalry. And the first uh, um, offensive against Nepal was actually not 1814, but 1767, when we defeated them. And, uh, and the East India Company and the Indian um, uh, army that they were working with had to, had to um, go back. But they came back in 1814 because then it looked like Nepal was getting even stronger and bigger. Um, so the strength at that time, of course, was that we were up in the mountains. Our, our planes were, uh, we were defended from the north with the mountains, but from the south by these jungles that had malaria. Um, and, uh, and the first 1716 East India uh, Company army was actually decimated by tigers and mosquitoes. <laughs> We call them our Mozi army. You know, <laughs> uh, they defended Nepal from the south. 
So it was nature, it was also uh, the fact that we commanded the higher ground. And in, 18, in 1767, the final straw for the British who were climbing the mountains towards our forts was that we were throwing, not just stones, but we were throwing hornets' nests at them. And so they just, uh, they couldn't handle it. So that was, the, what was your first question? The Maoists. The Maoists and their strength? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I think the fact that the fact that they existed and they grew so quickly was that the objective condition for revolution in 19 mid 90s was very strong. The feudalism, the discrimination, the social injustice meant that Nepal was ripe for revolution. So when they went out to mobilize uh, and when they talked about liberation, let's say to ethnic groups, it it really uh, struck a chord. And so they had no problems in recruitment. I mean, 35% of the Maoist army were women, guerrillas. So it was, uh, women felt uh, like they had been oppressed, so it was easy to talk to them to join the force. It was easy for them to recruit among the Janjatis, who were the indigenous people. And, um, and even you know, other class and castes were, were saying, well, Kathmandu is so centralized, they've been, you know, they've been running the country like it's a fiefdom, we need a new kind of system. And, Democracy had just come in in 1990. We had a new constitution in 1991, but already by 1995-96, there was this bickering between the UML and the, and the Nepali Congress, which meant that politics was already stuck in 95. So when the Maoists came in and said, well, "We'll we'll fix all this, but we need to take up arms," um, some people said, "Yeah, maybe that's the way. That's a shortcut." Uh, but of course. It, we're all disillusioned now with that, and the Maoists themselves are disillusioned with that rhetoric and the revolution. And of course, the Maoists in Nepal had nothing to do with Mao. Right? It was nothing to do with China. It was just an ideology. And if you look at when it started, 1992, it was after the collapse of the Sendero Revolution in Peru. So worldwide Maoists, the Revolutionary International Movement as they were called, needed another showcase revolution after Peru was defeated. So Nepal was the, was the next one. I remember by 1994, trekking up in the mountains and seeing a big cliff uh, near, uh, near Kumbu with a big red sign in Nepali that said, release Comrade Gonzalo. And I didn't even know who the hell Comrade Gonzalo was. It was Shining Path. In Nepal, in the remotest part of Nepal, you saw slogans uh, release Comrade Gonzalo. So there was a link, I think, between the between the defeat of the uh, Senderos in Peru and the rise of the Maoists in Nepal by the revolutionary internationals. And, and some of the documents show that Nepal was the next showcase. What is the next? Oh, your question. Yeah, the most difficult one for the last. Um, what is it again? During the balancing act and building your bilateral yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the same question as earlier. I think... Uh, there was a question on the balancing act. Yeah, yeah, Indian hegemony. I don't know. I think uh, we have to be very pragmatic in Nepal. As a smaller state, you always have to be pragmatic. You cannot, you cannot be confrontational. Just like in a, in a military offensive, you cannot, be, you cannot wage a confrontational war with a much superior enemy. You have to play guerrilla warfare, right? So it's similarly in foreign relations, if you're dealing with a larger, much more powerful uh, neighbor which has such great influence on your domestic politics, you have to be clever about it. You have to be cleverer than that larger neighbor uh, in a, to be able to handle what their concerns are. And Nepal, India's concerns are security, uh, it's water, it's maybe a little bit of trade, but and now it's China, uh, which is linked to security. It used to be ISI in Pakistan, but now it's China. Um, so knowing those concerns, you, you should not, like some of our leaders have done in the past, uh, try to irritate the larger neighbor to, to react. And that's what happened in 2015, was that we tried to irritate them needlessly. Uh, and I think we have to be much smarter about dealing with this um, so-called equidistance between Nepal and China. Uh, the geopolitics means that we are so overwhelming, overwhelmingly dependent economically on India. 90% of our trade is with India. Even the other trade is via India. Uh, we're not landlocked, but India-locked. 
Um, so um, in that kind of a situation, to try to be ultra-nationalist and irritate uh, a neighbor all the time may work to get you votes in elections, but it will not work in the longer term. A uh, 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 former Prime Minister of Nepal once uh, went to, uh, what is that, Manmohan Adhikari, went to Delhi as when they get elected, they always go to Delhi first. Uh, he went to Delhi and in a press conference he was asked, um, <coughs> uh, so in your election manifesto, you're very anti-Indian, you're baiting India all the time, you know, um, uh, so how does it work now you're here? You know, how are you going to deal with, uh, with the people you are calling uh, enemies in, uh, a while ago? And he said, and he said in Hindi, Aplog samajhte hai, election mein karna padta hai. You know, that, that in election time you have to use anything that will get you votes, meaning even anti-Indian rhetoric to get votes. So unfortunately they're pragmatic after they come to power, <laughs> but not so pragmatic when they're in election time. Um, but I think uh, in the end it's, um, it's where, it, when, when there's a crisis, you know, who, who's the one who will come to your help first? And, um, and I think um, after, the, after the earthquake, we really saw that within the next morning at 6 a.m., the Indian Air Force was in Kathmandu with uh, seven helicopters because the main problem after the earthquake was access to the remote areas. Our uh, army did not have the, uh, have the logistics to reach it. Um, the floods are, are another case where actually it's India that will suffer if, um, if the mountains are denuded. And these floods this year showed, if you look at the satellite pictures, you know, Bihar is completely inundated. And because uh, a lot of the roads have been built along the Nepal-India border on the Indian side, um, uh, towns inside Nepal got inundated as well. So this, 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 this really careless and reckless road building in the plains in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh is, is really bad for the people of both Nepal and India. And it, it can be a security issue in future if it's not addressed. Because these floods are going to get worse. Are you saying that the roads shouldn't be built? No, no, the roads are built, but they don't have enough drainage. So they're built across floodplains of rivers where the rivers used to meander, you know, and that's how floods were controlled naturally in the past. And now you build roads right across those rivers, and they act as dams. And, and, and the drainage is just not enough when there is a lot of um, water flow for the water to let through. And then, actually what's happening in Nepal is a microcosm of what's happening in Bihar with these embankments within Bihar. It's just that in Nepal, India, it's a national border, and therefore it gets the headlines. But the embankments and roads in Bihar that have been built recklessly have been the worst cause of floods in Bihar. And not just now, I mean, for the last 20, 25 years. So th that really needs to be addressed uh, in future. Um, what was the last one? India and, uh, well, Nepal and Bangladesh and China are getting together. I think connectivity would be the first step, but that's where we've failed. We've not even been uh, managed to do connectivity. Uh, Bangladesh, there are now quite a lot of flights, uh, but there's not a s there's no flights between I don't know um, uh, Nepal and, and any of the other states. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I think uh, Anish will have to probably call it. Call it yeah. yeah. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, we can continue the conversation later. Thank you, uh, Kunda, once again for a very wide-ranging and insightful talk. And as a token of appreciation, may I ask yeah, yes. Professor oh, Mitra to hand uh, a book produced by. Oh. I should be handing it over. Yeah. It's called Nation at Play. That's uh, done by him. <laughs> and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.